was into their life. Either they was using, they were selling, or knew somebody that was using or selling, and it was all tied in. I have uncles that's doing time. I have uncles that's, that got killed. You know, my whole family is wrapped up in it. In 1994, Dio began peddling dope and living the thug life. The 15-year-old was making a sale when the buyer robbed him. So that's what's really like putting me on that border borderline of saying, "Kill this m or just let him, just let it ride, bro." It was a voice saying, "Don't do it, don't do it," but that other voice was saying. Man, you on these streets, man. You can't let them keep doing this to you. That money is supposed to be for something else. Dio went home, got his gun, and began to hunt for the man who ripped him off. He found him in the interior hallway of a building in the Melf. Something just clicked on me, said, he said something to me, and I just lost it. I just lost it. He caught five before his body dropped. I was that mad. Dio killed the man and was sentenced to seven years for manslaughter. Instead of finishing high school, he came of age in prison. You got a tendency to, you know, either be or be got. You learn to survive more in jail than in the street. I came home as a man, basically, you know what I'm saying? You don't watch yourself in the city, you will get caught up. Getting caught up in the Big Easy can mean an early grave. No matter how much of a badass you think you are, you walk around the corner, you're going to get clipped. You're going to get shot. And there's too many damn funerals in this town. New Orleans, home to the Gotti Boys, one of the Big Easy's most notorious street gangs. The Gotti Boys run the Third Ward Triangle, formed by three housing projects, the Calio, Magnolia, and the Mel. Places synonymous with death. They have shows like The Cosby Show. You know what I'm saying? That's what everybody saw when they was a child. But you know, you wonder like, is that life really real? Because where I'm at, I'm saying this hell where I'm at, we get up in the morning and we hear gunshots. Born in 1979, Garcito Hickerson, street name Cito, was raised in the Third Ward. Cito describes a place without hope. I mean, anything else is out your reach. That's how you feel. Because it's like New Orleans, the city is like bowl, where you just, you feel like you're a crab in the bucket and you can't get out this the projects, completed in the 1960s, were meant to help low-income families, but soon became run down. You're living in these two bedroom apartments. It's the ghetto, like, you know, high, high stereotype. It ain't nowhere that, that I would prefer to grow up. The projects were constructed almost entirely from concrete, a fact residents learned to appreciate as drugs and gunfire flooded the area. It is the chopper city, and this is a chopper. Chop you to a little pieces. Assault rifles is all guys is shooting down here. Yeah, concrete protecting those kids. So when they inside, first thing they do, get on the, get on the floor, and everything will be all right. Bullets ain't gonna come through this concrete wall. Single mothers who seem trapped in a desperate cycle struggle to raise their children, who are forced to take on adult worries. No real man can't look at his mom and she can't put food on the table. Can't no man do that. It's gonna get to them when they sleep. Like, man, I ain't letting my mom go through this shit. And if I gotta die trying to do something, then that's what I'm gonna do. The kids in the projects saw one way out, dealing. To them, the drug dealers were role models. They had money, women, guns, and respect. You might be a youngster. Nine, ten years old, you see the dudes with the big fancy cars coming by, and you know, you like, you seeing this, you like, man, that's what I want. You made me want to be a gangster, period. Cito wasn't the only one 
In the 1990s, a handful of kids from the projects formed a gang and began calling themselves the Gotti Boys. When the Gotti Boys, you know, whatever it was, you know, they got it. Many of the Gotti Boys were related, brothers, cousins, and even uncles. Yet their loyalty to the gang ran thicker than blood. You know, if something go down with this person who you slept and ate with, ran the streets with as a child, you know, you're going to help him. You're going to be there for him no matter what. 25-year-old Damian Allen, street name Dip, grew up in the Third Ward and joined the Gotti Boys at age 14. That was my family. You know, right now, today, that still is my family. Ain't no word that still is my family. By age 15, Dip was dealing drugs. He learned early that survival in the projects is never guaranteed. This is something that been with us before Katrina, you know. We was always on our own. We always had to get it how we live. Get it how you live is like, if you walking down the street, find some money. You found it, that's yours. You got it how you live. The Gotti boys got it how they lived, by dealing heroin and crack. In 1998, Uncle Laurel nearly lost his life when he was shot by a dope dealer in the mouth. I got shot trying to shoot somebody. I ran out bullets. I got in the hallway, so I had to catch me some shelter. I run out. Get them off me, but I'm all bust up, but I ain't realize I've been hit all in my heart. You know, and I'm moving with bullets in me. I mean, they traveling. I mean, the, the more I moved, the worse it was getting. He collapsed in the hallway. A neighbor who witnessed the shooting called for help. Uncle Laurel was rushed to the hospital where he remained in a coma for four days. It wouldn't be the last time his family would deal with drug-related violence. Laurel's cousin, Cornelius Cobbins, a.k.a. Baby Kiki, was a hero in these projects. Baby Kiki, that's my, that's my boy. That's my, that's, that's my heart, you know what I'm saying? He was a part of us. Kiki was a Gotti boy who made bank in the drug trade. We all made money. Dip made money. Deal made money. I made money. But Kiki, Kiki used to just have money everywhere. It's something about the project was just made for Kiki. He jumped into the game or whatever and uh, started doing this thing as far as hustling and all that stuff, being flashed with the money. Dressing, living that lifestyle, a lot of cars. Kiki was seen as a Robin Hood type outlaw in the Third Ward. He even bought the neighborhood kids school supplies when their parents couldn't afford them. Kiki was also known for the car he tricked out with expensive stereo speakers. In October 2000, Kiki stopped his car under the Claiborne Bridge to fix his speakers. While he was making the repair, a rival gang member gunned him down. Uncle Laurel was devastated. And that was the best thing that the streets ever took from me. You know what I'm saying? So I mean, no matter how I change or what I do, I'm gonna be gangland for life. You know what I'm saying? Behind him, I love him. I die for him. I told you, we got baptized together. We were supposed to die together. Kiki's killer has never been caught. The Gotti boys know that life on the streets often means an early death. No one is immune, not even the famous. In 2003, Soldier Slim, a rapper known as the Tupac of New Orleans, was a rising star in the hip hop world. Soldier Slim was really rapping what he was living. And ain't nobody gonna sit up here and say Soldier Slim was a studio gangster. You can't believe that. And nobody gonna tell you that. His name was Magnolia Slim before it was Soldier Slim. So he had the hood on his back already. 
The 25-year-old Slim was standing in his mother's front yard when he was gunned down. Shot three times in the face. While no one is talking, the suspicion is the murder was a paid hit, sparked by jealousy over Slim's quick rise to fame. Any black man with a lot of money, he's a target. No matter what you're doing, it's the way it is. You just gotta live with it. After a short investigation, the cops arrested a 22-year-old suspect. In his possession, they later found a stolen police pistol with a scratched-off serial number. A ballistics test matched bullets from that gun to those in Slim's body. But no witnesses would testify against Smith. By 2008, the suspect had been arrested for three more murders. In each case, charges were dropped. It was a common story in the Big Easy. The district attorney's office dropped the murder